just going to wait a couple minutes and allow everyone to join a couple seconds. Okay, I'm gonna begin. Thank you all for joining us today for the webinar, Exploring Minnesota's Adult Use Cannabis Law, presented by Saul Ewing's attorneys. We're gonna focus our discussion on topics relating to Minnesota's new adult use cannabis law by examining the implications of the law for all Minnesota employers, including those related to drug testing and drug-free workplace policies. We will also address topics relevant for businesses, including regulatory licensing and tax issues. My name is Doug Anderson. I'm a litigation associate in the Minneapolis Saul Ewing office. With me are two of my colleagues, also from the Minneapolis office. Steve Kerbaugh is a labor and employment specialist. Um, he's gonna provide an overview of the impact the new law has on drug testing, employer policies and anti-discrimination laws. Erin Westbrook is also, also in the litigation department. She has experience in cannabis related business and IP litigation. She will provide an overview of the business licensing and regulation side of the new law. They've both been great mentors to me and you could not ask for two better attorneys to give you a breakdown of this new law. Uh, before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping announcements that I need to read through. First, we're going to have a jam-packed presentation today, but if you do have questions that arise throughout the presentation, there's questions can be submitted through a question and answer tool on the bottom of your screen. We may have time at the end of the presentation to address, address some questions, but if we don't get to your question, we'll... Um, We'll follow up with an individual email addressing your question. This program has been approved for one continuing learning education credit in Minnesota. As a CLE provider, we need to verify your attendance. Therefore, ran at random points during the webinar, we will display and verbally announce a couple of numeric reporting codes that you must record and report back to us using the CLE survey that you received in your webinar reminder email. The survey will also open automatically in your browser at the completion of the program. We will in turn send you a certificate of attendance once we receive your survey response. Please be sure to respond to the Saul Ewing CLE survey with your numeric codes within five days of this program. Following this webinar, you will receive a follow-up email that will include links to the webinar's recording and also supplemental presentation materials and CLE information. Uh, the provision and receipt of information in this program is not legal advice, does not create a lawyer-client relationship, and should not be acted on without seeking professional counsel who have been informed on the specific facts. That's all for the housekeeping. So I'm gonna turn it over to Steve to talk to you about employment law. Great, thanks, Doug. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please, Maddie. Um, and let's go to the next one. So I wanna start off by talking about just a couple of issues about how cannabis affects the workplace. Um, with new statutes that are being passed in different states, uh, there are now parameters around when <clears throat> cannabis can be taken into account with regard to hiring decisions, also when it can be taken into account uh, with regard to disciplinary and firing issues. We're going to talk about that and what the Minnesota statute has to say about that today. Obviously, one of the biggest issues that we think about when we think about cannabis in the workplace is drug testing. Can you still do it with regard to cannabis and under what circumstances? The Minnesota law has a lot to say about that. We're going to talk about that, too. Then there's the issue of cannabis use on and off premises and also on site possession. Are these things that can still be barred now that it's legal, um, you know, more broadly? Um, we'll talk about policies that you can enact around that. And then finally, training and security are a couple of other issues that we think about when we think about how cannabis uh, affects the workplace. 
if we could go to the next slide, please. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time belaboring federal law, but suffice it to say, there's a difference between what's permitted under federal law and what's permitted under uh, the laws of many different states. Um, under the Controlled Substances Act, cannabis is classified as a Schedule One drug. Uh, meaning that it's highly addictive with no medical value. Um, now, there is uh, a recommendation from the Department of Health and Human Services that cannabis actually be rescheduled as a Schedule Three drug, uh, which would put it in the company of drugs like Tylenol with codeine that have a moderate to low risk potential when it comes down to physical and psychological dependence. Um, that will have some effects on things like um, you know, financing and, and potentially taxation, it's not really going to have much of an effect, at least not initially, on the employment implications. So I'm not going to um, spend a whole lot of time talking about the schedule change, which, um, you know, may very well be imminent. I think a lot of folks are expecting some movement on that um, last week. Also, um, the Controlled, Controlled Substances Act does not recognize a difference between medical and adult or recreational use. So um, another important thing to point out, obviously, a lot of states, um, including Minnesota for a time, uh, had permitted uh, you know, medicinal use, but not adult use. Um, also, we've got federal regulations that are going to be applicable to those in certain industries. Um, the Department of Transportation is a perfect example. Uh, DOT regulations, uh, you know, apply to commercial, uh, you know, drivers. And so there's going to be uh, some federal regulations applicable to certain classes of employees, regardless of what the state law provides in terms of, um, you know, adult use. All right, Matt, if we could go to the next slide, please. With state laws, um, statutory language is key. Um, that's going to be uh, setting the parameters around employee protections and employer obligations. Um, it's important to look at, uh, you know, not only the language uh, with regard to, you know, kind of discrimination off use, but also uh, when it comes down to, um, you know, basically uh, disability laws and whether there's going to be an obligation uh, to allow for reasonable accommodations for uh, medicinal uh, cannabis use. So we're going to be focusing on some statutory language for Minnesota today. And, oh, we've got a CLE code, our very first one. I almost missed it. Um, if you are watching this and you would like to claim uh, Minnesota CLE credit, your first code is 52397. That's 52397. Um, okay, great. Um, Maddie, if we could advance. So here's just a current status. You'll, you'll see the blue here um, is where cannabis is legal for recreational use. Green is where it's legal for medical use. And um, Minnesota is now in the blue category. It's, um, you know, one of the Johnny come latelys. It's uh, relatively new in Minnesota. Uh, um, I think it's actually been uh, legalized in other places like Ohio since even we have, uh, you know, gone ahead and, and legalized adult use in Minnesota. But I put this up here uh, just to make the point that if you are a multi-state employer and you've got employees located in other jurisdictions, your policies may very well be different if the employees in, you know, Wisconsin um, or, or even another state where it's legal, um, like Illinois or New York, um, you know, uh, there may be different policies that are applicable to them, uh, given, you know, the statutory protections or lack thereof uh, that will apply. So uh, just something to keep in mind. There's really not a one size fits all policy solution at this point uh, when it comes down to uh, cannabis in the workplace, um, you know, uh, so uh, with certain exceptions, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, why is it important to comply with the protections that are applicable uh, to employees in the workplace? Because you could get in trouble if you, if you don't. OK, uh, plaintiffs in many states have challenged their termination uh, for positive cannabis test results, and the claims are typically in one of two categories. One is that the employer violated the state cannabis statutes anti-discrimination provision. Uh, we're going to be talking about Minnesota's in a minute. 
And then another is that an employer violated a state anti-discrimination statute because medical cannabis was a treatment for a disability and thus the employee is entitled to a reasonable accommodation. And in Minnesota, we've got the Minnesota Human Rights Act that requires an interactive dialogue um, if an individual has a disability and um, you know, uh, a treatment regimen with medical cannabis may very well be part and parcel of uh, you know that dialogue in the event that you've got a cannabis uh, medical cannabis patient. So something to keep in mind. If we could go to the next slide, please. Let's talk about Minnesota. Let's get let's get down into an overview. Um, the new cannabis laws provide for numerous employee protections. Okay, um, employers are prohibited from discriminating against employees for using cannabis outside of work. Um, employers are also generally cannot refuse to hire a job applicant because of private cannabis use. That is also new. Um, there's also significant parameters around when testing for cannabis is permitted. Uh, the Minnesota Drug and Alcohol Testing in the Workplace Act, which I'll refer to as DATWA uh, throughout this presentation, has actually been amended so that cannabis is not included in the definition of drug. Um, drugs and alcohol are kind of treated uh, differently than cannabis in lots of different portions of the state statute, and we'll be discussing some of those distinctions a little bit later on. Also, I want to draw a contrast to Minnesota statute and some other uh, statutes. Um, in Minnesota, it's very clear that there are private rights of action for violations of employee rights. So there can be significant repercussions to an employer for failing to comply with the protections in the event that an employee uh, brings a lawsuit or the state looks at you know, what it views as kind of broad, um, widespread violations of DATWA, okay? Um, I, I draw a contrast to, uh, for example, the state of New Jersey, where the statute didn't make it clear that there was a private right of action, and then whether or not an employee could actually sue for an employer violating obligations uh, to employees under the adult use statute uh, became an issue that went to the courts. And there was actually a court that said, yeah, you can't sue for this. The statute doesn't provide for it. Um, so uh, that uh, matter, I think, is still working itself through the court system. But in Minnesota, right off the bat, the legislature made it very clear that here there are indeed uh, private rights of action for violations of the statute. All right, if we could go to the next slide, please. Now let's talk about drug testing. This is going to be the bulk of the presentation because it's the bulk of the, uh, of I think the kind of employment implications for this. And there's a difficulty uh, with drug testing for cannabis that doesn't exist with regard to other controlled substances. Um, cannabis is detectable in blood and urine for up to a month, and it's actually detectable in hair uh, pretty significantly longer. Uh, THC is stored in uh, lipid or fat compartments throughout our bodies, uh, so consistent use will result in accumulation of THC in that fatty tissue, and the more that it accumulates, the slower the elimination rates. So if an individual is consistently using cannabis, um, they will likely always test positive on a drug test, which makes things a little bit tricky when you're talking about, okay, we're going to test for uh, perceived impairment at work. Okay, um, it's possible that there's a positive test, but that individual wasn't actually impaired, um, you know, uh, by cannabis on that particular day. It's a scenario that may happen, something we've got to be cognizant of and something we have to take into account when we think about uh, drug testing individuals and also disciplining for uh, positive tests. Let's go to the next slide, please. So there's lots of different kinds of testing. Um, drug and alcohol testing, the most common, I think, that people think about when they think about uh, drug testing for employees is actually not even employees, but applicants, um, pre-employment testing. For cannabis, there's some statutory protections for applicants that essentially provide that employers can't discriminate against them in hiring because they uh, test positive for cannabis and they can't even actually request or require a job applicant to undergo testing. Uh, Minnesota Statute 181.951, Subdivision 8, 
provides in sections A and B that an employer must not request or require a job applicant to undergo testing solely for the purpose of determining the presence or absence of cannabis as a condition of employment, unless otherwise required by state or federal law. And that's going to be a refrain that we see throughout the statute. Um, also, unless otherwise required by state or federal law, an employer must not refuse to hire a job applicant solely because a job applicant submits to a cannabis test or a drug and alcohol test authorized by this section and the results of the test indicate the presence of cannabis. Okay, these are new protections. Uh, we can't discriminate in hiring on the basis of a cannabis test result. Now, there are some exceptions, okay? Um, subdivision 9 of that same statute, 181.951, uh, provides that um, you can test uh, as a preliminary matter, for example, for safety sensitive positions. Now, what does that mean? A safety sensitive position is a job, including any supervisory or management position in which an impairment caused by drugs, alcohol, or cannabis usage would threaten the health or safety of any person. Okay. When I think of safety sensitive positions, I think about heavy equipment operators, forklift drivers, um, you know, uh, those who are um, obviously driving, uh, you know, trucks or every he other heavy machinery. Uh, but there's uh, lots of examples of that. And really, um, you know, the employer has to, to think about whether or not there's a risk of of the employee um, you know, causing harm to somebody else in their job if they're impaired in determining whether that exception may apply. Uh, there's other exceptions for peace officers, firefighters, those providing face-to-face -face care, training, education, supervision, counseling, medical assistance, et cetera, to children, vulnerable adults, or healthcare patients. Um, there's positions requiring CDLs or commercial driver's license. And then there's positions funded by federal grants or for which state or federal law requires testing. Again, the state law um, doesn't want to step on the toes of the federal government. It's not going to require anybody to forego grants, um, you know, in the event that testing is a condition of federal grants. And it also, um, you know, will allow for testing in circumstances when, for example, the DO regu uh, DOL regulation will require it um, for commercial truck drivers, uh, for example. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please, Maddie. So there's some other types of testing. Um, one is routine physical examination testing. Uh, generally, you cannot test for cannabis in connection with routine physical examination testing. You can for drugs and alcohol, okay? Um, and you could before uh, as well, as long as sufficient notice is provided, uh, but cannabis was not um, you know, added into that section um, in uh, the amendment. So generally you're not gonna be able to do that in terms of routine physical examination testing. Random testing, as a general rule of thumb, I want you to think that it's probably not okay to do random testing either. Um, you can test for cannabis on a random basis, but only if the employee is employed in the safety sensitive position. Again, we're gonna have to think about whether uh, their role could cause harm to some other person. Your, your you know, worker in the mail room is not gonna be in a safety sensitive position, for example. Um, another uh, uh, carve out there is you can do random testing if the employee is a professional athlete subject to a collective bargaining agreement. That um, particular prong is probably not going to be invoked as much, uh, but that's a, another uh, time you can do random testing. Now, <clears throat> reasonable suspicion testing. This one's an important one, okay? Um, you generally can test for cannabis if there is reasonable suspicion to believe that the employee is impaired at work, um, has violated written work rules prohibiting the use, possession, sale, or transfer of drugs or alcohol while working on an employee's premises, and that would include cannabis, um, has sustained a personal injury or caused personal injury to another, or has caused a work-related accident or was operating or helping operate machinery, equipment, or vehicles involved in a work-related accident. So your post-accident testing and your, I believe this employee is under the influence at work testing uh, can still occur uh, for cannabis if there's a reasonable suspicion. And, um, you know, that's uh, something that I want to talk about just a little bit more in the next slide, please. Uh, 
you want to proceed very, very cautiously with reasonable suspicion testing, um, you know, especially when we're talking about perceived impairment. A best practice is going to be to require two supervisors to observe the behavior and come to the conclusion that it objectively raises a suspicion uh, for use. Okay. Um, it's difficult to detect impairment for marijuana uh, or cannabis, but some things we think about are, for example, red eyes, lethargy, uh, confusion. Um, and then, of course, there's the smell. Although some jurisdictions, like, for example, New York, has, uh, you know, provided uh, administrative guidance that says smell alone isn't going to cut it. Um, so you're going to want to uh, be careful. You're going to want to, you know, observe uh, these kinds of some uh, symptoms of impairment, and then you're going to want to document them, and you're going to want to document them well. You're also going to want to maintain the confidentiality of that documentation, um, as you would typically with all employee personnel information. Um, and there's also going to be some uh, confidentiality protections that are applicable to drug testing more generally we'll talk about later. Um, you're also going to want to give the employee an opportunity to provide information that management should consider before making its decision if the test results are positive. Now, that's the protection the Minnesota law provides for anyway. Um, you've got to provide the employee with written notice of their opportunity to um, essentially explain a positive test. But I would suggest that it's worthwhile to go beyond providing notice of the opportunity and just say, you know, hey, look, is there, um, you know, anything you think that we should know before taking any action in connection with this positive test, you know, to affirmatively provide that opportunity as well and demonstrate that you're giving an employee a fair shake. Um, you want to be very careful with reasonable suspicion testing uh, because, as we'll discuss a little bit later on, there's a hook uh, for employees to uh, raise claims if they think that uh, the testing was arbitrary or capricious. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but um, it all makes documentation and, um, you know, multiple observation, et cetera, really important. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> the final type of testing we'll talk about here is treatment program testing. Um, generally, you can test for cannabis when an employee has been referred by the employer to a substance use disorder treatment or evaluation program um, or is participating in such a program under an employee benefit plan. Um, employees can be tested uh, in the aftermath of completion of one of those programs for a period of up to two years. Um, and they can be tested without notice during that period. OK, you don't have to do this. Um, but it is um, something that can be done uh, with regard to cannabis, okay? And with regard to treatment programs to uh, one of the safeguards provided to employees who test positive um, for uh, drugs, alcohol, um, or cannabis is that they have an opportunity to attend uh, one of these programs. So uh, just as an aside, uh, that's a procedural requirement that's available to them. And after that um, requirement has run its course, if the employee avails himself of the opportunity to go through one of those programs, um, you can continue to test. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk about some protections for employees when it comes down to testing. Um, Minnesota is a state that has very arduous policy requirements, um, more so than virtually every state um, in the country, in my experience. Um, any testing that you do for drugs, alcohol, or cannabis uh, must be pursuant to a written policy that complies with the elements of Minnesota Statute 181.952. It's got to set forth the employees subject to testing under the policy, the circumstances under which testing may be requested or required, the right of an employee to refuse testing and the consequences of refusal, which in every policy um, I've been involved with is virtually always been dismissal uh, from employment. Um, it's got to discuss any disciplinary or adverse personnel action that may be taken based on a confirmatory test verifying an initial positive test result. And that's a procedural mechanism that uh, exists for the protection of employees. After an initial positive test result, there's always, always gotta be a confirmatory test result. Um, and then it's got to discuss the right of an employee or a job applicant 
to explain a positive test result on a confirmatory test or to request and pay for a confirmatory retest. There also has to be a description of any appeal procedures available. So it's it's kind of an onerous uh, policy requirement list. And I always go beyond, um, you know, kind of the bare bones of what's required in the policy to include most of the procedural, um, you know, requirements and, and that are otherwise available um, for or exist for the protection of employees, which we'll talk about in the next slide. But I will say that this policy needs to be provided to every um, you know, person who's subject to it uh, before they're subject to testing. In fact, before employees are tested, you actually have to provide them uh, with, uh, you know, an acknowledgement where they sign indicating that they've uh, had an opportunity to review the policy. And you also need to post in your uh, workplace in a conspicuous place um, the fact that the company has a policy, if it need it does, and where it can be accessed during work hours. Um, so uh, Minnesota has a lot of employee protections around uh, that with the policies. Now let's talk about the procedures. Um, lots of protections with the procedures as well. Um, all cannabis testing must comply with the reliability and fairness safeguards applicable to drug and alcohol testing found in Minnesota statute section 181.953. And I'm not gonna go over every one of these in detail. This statute is fairly long, uh, but it requires, for example, use of a licensed or certified laboratory for testing. Um, you know, employers aren't doing this on site. Um, it requires testing, reporting, and sample retention requirements. Um, there are employer, employer chain of custody procedures. Um, there's also employee rights in the testing process and notification to employees of same, um, you know, and at different parts in the testing process too. Um, and there's limitations on employee discharge, discipline, or discrimination, one of which I uh, referred to earlier in the ability uh, to uh, go to a treatment program. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Now, here's something that's new and specific to cannabis. Um, Minnesota statute 181.953 subdivision 10A, um, you know, basically talks about when you can discipline or discharge an employee uh, for using, possessing, being impaired by or selling or transferring uh, cannabis while working um, on premises or operating the employer's machinery. And it's got to fit within one of these four uh, prongs. Uh, one is if as a result of consuming cannabis, the employee does not possess a clearness of intellect and control of self that the employee would otherwise have. What this means and um, how that ultimately gets litigated is going to be interesting, uh, to say the least. I think we're going to see a lot of case law surrounding uh, some of these particular provisions. Uh, but that's one circumstance in which uh, you can um, discipline an employee uh, when clearly they are impaired in that they don't have the clearness of intellect to control the um, um, would be expected of them. Uh, second, if cannabis testing verifies the presence of cannabis following a confirmatory test, again, all of your testing procedures need to be pursuant to a policy and uh, include um, all the procedural safeguards required in the statute. Um, third, as provided in the employer's written work rules for cannabis and cannabis testing, provided the policy complies with statutory requirements. And fourth, as otherwise authorized or required by state or federal law or regulations, or a failure to do so would cause an employer to lose monetary or a licensing related benefit under federal law or regulations. Again, um, we see a lot of deference to federal law uh, with regard to those particular requirements throughout the statute. Um, okay, next slide, please. Another protection for employees is cannabis testing, like drug and alcohol testing is going to be subject to confidentiality safeguards. Um, laboratories uh, can only disclose to employers data regarding the presence of the drug, alcohol, cannabis, or their metabolites uh, in the te uh, sample tested. They can't share other information. Um, you know, test results are generally private and confidential information subject to uh, certain statutory exceptions. And positive test results from an employer cannot be used as evidence in a criminal action against an employee. That doesn't really bear so much on, um, you know, employers. You're not typically seeing subpoenas uh, from, you know, district attorneys for drug test results. Uh, but it's just another protection in the statute. 
Um, another important protection in this one, I want to spend just a couple minutes emphasizing employers cannot require employees or applicants to quote unquote, undergo cannabis testing on an arbitrary or capricious basis. What does that mean? I don't know. Um, but I expect that there's going to be a lot of litigation around it because when an employer, um, for example, has reasonable suspicion for uh, saying that an employee may be impaired in the workplace, decides to test, an employee says, no, that was arbitrary or capricious, all of a sudden you've got, you know, kind of a, a battle uh, between uh, the two parties with regard to whether there was reasonable suspicion and whether uh, any kind of testing was arbitrary or capricious. So um, just another uh, reason for you to always, um, you know, involve more than one person if possible um, and appropriate people uh, in determining whether or not um, management folks, for example, in determining whether or not, you know, there's reasonable suspicion for testing and then documenting, documenting, documenting. So you can, in the event of, um, you know, God forbid litigation, say this wasn't arbitrary or capricious. We had clear reasons for doing what we did, and we were concerned about the safety of our folks, this individual, this individual's ability to perform their job, what have you. Um, okay, next slide, please. Real quick note on medical cannabis patients. Um, employee, employees generally cannot be discriminated against in hiring, firing, or terms and conditions of employment because they're enrolled in the Minnesota Medical Cannabis Registry Program. In the event that they test positive for cannabis use, um, I would expect that an employee would uh, use their enrollment in that program to explain a positive test result uh, when they're offered that opportunity as they're um, you know, obligated to be offered that opportunity under the statute. Um, test, uh, positive tests for cannabis or cannabis metabolites, unless the employee possessed, sold, transferred, or uh, transported, or is impaired by cannabis while on work premises, um, you know, generally can't be used uh, as a basis for uh, disciplining somebody who's in the medical uh, cannabis program. Now, there's exceptions here too, again, state or federal law, or the employer would lose federal funding or a licensing related benefit. Okay, next slide, please. Repercussions of violating DATWA. Um, there's some teeth to this, okay? Um, employers may be liable to the employee in a civil action for damages incurred by the employee, which could include, for example, back or front pay in a termination position, uh, situation. It could also include, um, you know, front pay if an applicant is wrongfully uh, denied uh, employment. So um, there's some damages that could come into play. And then also reasonable attorney's fees if the employer knowingly or recklessly violated the statute. Okay. A court can also award equitable relief that includes enjoining an employer from further violations of DATWA, and um, it can order an injured employee or job applicant reinstatement with back pay. Um, that happens pretty infrequently, I'm going to say, in the um, in the realm of employment law. Um, I, I don't think I've ever seen it, quite frankly, although there are cases that allow that. Um, but that's just another potential remedy. Um, okay, going on. Let's talk about, um, let's go to the next slide, please, and maybe even two more. We've talked a lot about stuff you can't do as an employer. Let's talk about some things that you can do as an employer. Um, employers can prohibit employees from using cannabis in the workplace while working or while operating the employer's vehicles, machinery, or equipment. Um, employers can prohibit employees from being impaired by cannabis in the workplace during work hours. And again, the challenge is identifying who's impaired. Um, and then employers can prohibit the possession of cannabis at work. They can also prohibit the sale or transfer of cannabis at work. The law is very clear that all of these things are permitted. But next slide, please. They have to be permitted pursuant to a policy. Um, okay, or they have to be uh, pursuant to a policy. If you wanna curtail these things, uh, you have to have a statutorily compliant policy to that effect. Um, the statute expressly provides an employer may only enact and enforce or written work rules prohibiting cannabis flower, cannabis product, lower potency hemp edibles, and hemp derived consumer product use, possession, impairment, sale, or transfer while the employee is working or while an employee is on the employer's premises or operating vehicle, machine, and equipment in a written policy that complies with the minimum information required by that particular section of the statute. 
So it's really important that all policies relating to these issues are written in the company of the statute and, um, you know, uh, probably uh, best best practice, certainly, to involve outside counsel to make sure that they're compliant. And you're not going to run the risk of those kinds of employee lawsuits or mistakes that you might um, otherwise run. That does it for me for now, anyway, on the employment issues. Uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Aaron Westbrook to talk about some of the, the business-related issues. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm going to switch gears here and now really focus on, you know, how do we enter this space in Minnesota now that it's now that it's here? I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, how we got to this point, how we got to legalization just really quickly. Um, I'm going to go on to talk about how the space will be regulated, the different types of license types and some considerations for licenses. Um, and then what's coming in the new legislative session, which just started yesterday. And I think there's going to be um, some, some relevant, uh, possibly changes to the law that comes out of that. And finally, I'll just talk briefly about some of the taxation issues. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so how we got here, uh, some of you may know or remember uh, back in July 1st, 2022, when hemp derived products were legalized and, you know, depending on, you, on who you ask, that that may have been a mistake. Not everybody seemed to have known that it was being passed, but in any event, it, it came um, and it was uh, basically immediately upon effect, it, people started selling these products, um, not a lot of regulation, not a lot of enforcement. Uh, things like that. So there were some issues with that. Moving on, the governor signed HF 100, which is the legalization bill, uh, May 30th, 2023, making Minnesota the 23rd state to legalize it. Um, jumping ahead to some of the more current things, um, as of October 1st, 2023, uh, sellers of those hemp-derived uh, products were required to register with the Department of Health. So prior to that, in this kind of you know, accidental uh, bill that was that was passed in 2022. There really was no no registration requirements, no licenses. Um, I think the only place you could not sell it was was a liquor store. Oddly enough, um, so so the the new bill, the legalization bill, has kind of changed all that, um, requiring these businesses that previously were in business to be registered with the Department of Health for the time being, will ultimately move over to the Office of Cannabis Management, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so since the bill came into effect August 1st, the uh, the bill establishes the Office, of, the Office of Cannabis Management, which is supposed to, you know, kind of take control, uh, regulate, enforce, things like that. Um, and it did that August 1st. The expectation currently is that they will open the application process for licenses for licenses um, as early as 2025 um, and also begin issuing licenses. I have an asterisk there. We'll talk about it a little bit at the end. Um, there may be some changes to that based on what the Office of Cannabis Management or OCM, I may call it, um, has asked the legislature to do this session because uh, they are behind. So we'll talk about that at the end. Um, and let's move on to the next slide. Please. So the Office of Cannabis Management, um, the legalization law established this office. It did not previously exist. Um, like I said, the, the these hemp products that were legalized in 2022 were actually under the, the regulation of the Department of uh, Pharmacy. Uh, and not a lot there to not a lot of resources there to be able to help them. So, like I said, as of October first, those hemp uh, those businesses selling hemp products were required to register with the Department of Health, no no charge, um, and they'll be able to operate under that registration until March first, twenty twenty five, uh, when they'll when they'll have to you know go through the license process with the OCM. But these are just a few of the things that OCM is, is going to be doing. Uh, currently, they're in rulemaking phase. So the legislature really gave the office a lot of discretion to kind of um, figure out how to, how to manage these licenses, how to meet certain goals set by the legislature, like meeting market demand, um, market stability, things like that. Um, it also gives the office, of course, the ability to investigate violations, enforce regulations, 
uh, and things like that. And we'll get into uh, kind of more of what the office is, is doing as we move forward. If you could go to the next slide, please, Maddie. So the law provides for a lot of different types of licenses. I think there's, I think there's 14 total. Um, we are not going to talk about the medical cannabis licenses today. We just don't have, don't have the time. Um, know that that medical cannabis has been, uh, has been around. It is, uh, it is also going to be part of the office of cannabis management, but we are not going to talk about that today just because of the other things we're trying to get through. So the first three that I have on my slide here, we've got cannabis micro business, cannabis meso business, and cannabis cultivator. These are all uh, different growing licenses, different uh, different licenses to you know allow you to grow the product. They are based on size, as you can see here. Micro business, you know, five thousand square feet of uh, indoor space or half acre outdoors. Meso business, fifteen thousand. Cannabis cultivator, thirty thousand. Um, notably though, the legislature did give the office of cannabis management, some discretion to expand these limits. So these are, these are statutory limitations, but, you know, to meet those goals that I mentioned before, you know, meeting market demand, stabilizing the market, things like that, the office of cannabis management is allowed to increase those limits. So I think that's just going to be something that we'll, we'll have to see what, We'll have to see what happens. Um, you know, I, I expect that there will be a lot of license applications. Um, I, you know, I think that they have estimated that this is going to be about a $1.5 billion industry by 2029 years. So um, we'll, we'll just see what the office decides to do and, and how that all goes. Um, I mentioned on this slide something about vertical integration for so micro businesses and meso businesses um, both allowed vertical integrate integration cannabis cultivators not it's prohibited and I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, in, in a few minutes here. Um, so if we could move on to the next slide please Maddie. So these are additional licenses um, like I said the first the first page was kind of the the growers. Um, these are these are the other licenses that are available. So manufacturer, retailer, wholesaler, transporter, testing facility, delivery service, and event organizer. Um, you can kind of see all the different application fees. Um, they they're quite a range, right? So you know, transporter as low as two fifty. Um, you know, and something like a manufacturer is going up to ten thousand dollars. I don't think we talked about it on the prior page, but the the micro business uh, fees or the pardon me the the fees for the uh, the growers range from five hundred dollars for the micro business up to ten thousand dollars for a cultivator just for the application fee um, you know and the and the fees get even bigger than that for the license fee and and renewal fee so for a micro business the renewal fee is two thousand for the cultivator it's thirty thousand so pretty big. Uh, Pretty big disparity there and obviously based on size of the operations um so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna you know kind of read all the slides but just a couple things to note um i think some of them are self-explanatory of course manufacturer um is, is essentially to buy the, the various you know flower cannabis hemp things like that and then make them into products um retailers there is a limit on how many retail locations um, you can have a, a retailer can have five locations per license um, and only one license per retailer, notably. Um, the other thing that I think is, is of some note is this cannabis event organizer. Um, so these are for uh, temporary events. So no more than four days. Um, there's no renewal fee because it's just a one time event. I don't know if anybody is I know recently. I think it was October. It was September. Um, um, Surly Brewing had a held an event called the Legacy Cup, and you know it was something that uh, people could go. They could they could purchase uh, they could purchase kind of what's what is available for sale at the time, which which at the time and currently is not cannabis. It was still only the lower potency hemp edibles. Um, and there and there was you know there was no requirement to get a license to do that. There may have been you know some sort of 
state and local require or license requirement, but there was no requirement at the time under um, kind of under the OCM. There will be in the future once once OCM gets these licenses all worked out. Um, that type of event will have to have a license. It's a one-time license. You have to get it for every event that you're going to do, um, you know, even if it's an annual event. So that's just something to note. Um, if you want to go on to the next slide, um, I'll just quickly run through these lower potency hemp edible licenses. So uh, for these, these are, um, these are for, or the products that were previously legal, like I said, under that July 2022 law. So manufacturer, retailer license, uh, that's it. Um, and you can continue selling these products without a license until March 1st, 2025. Um, so just to, just to back up a little bit, um, currently, as I mentioned, there are businesses selling lower potency hemp edibles. Those those are uh, those are legal. Those are legal to be sold. Those are legal to be manufactured, even without these licenses until March 2025. The cannabis business li licenses that we just talked about are still being worked out by the OCM, um, and so currently you cannot sell any of the cannabis products. You can't you can't operate any cannabis businesses until the OCM kind of works through the process gets the application structure up and running um, and actually issues those licenses, which we'll talk more about what it's gonna take to get to that momentarily. Um, you can go to the next slide, please, Maddie. So I mentioned before vertical integration and generally the statute has a prohibition on vertical integration, meaning you can't have one entity, one business that's doing everything. So all those different licenses, you know, uh, cultivator, retail, wholesale, manufacturer, transporting, things like that. Generally speaking, uh, you can't have one business doing that. And that's really to kind of promote this, um, you know, this kind of spread the wealth idea. The, the state did not want to uh, kind of have, you know, just a big, lots of capital entity coming in and, you know, taking over the market. So there's a reason for that. And that's pretty clear in the law. Um, but consistent with that, that whole concept, there are some exceptions. So the micro business and the mezzo business license allow you to do most, most things that the other licenses do. So, you know, grow, manufacture, purchase, um, package and label for sale, sell product, um, they also allow you to, excuse me, um, operate a, a retail site with that allows for on-site consumption of of edible products. Um, so, so those two license types do kind of allow for some vertical integration, um, and you don't have to get any of the other license types to do those things with the micro or the mezzo business. Uh, a couple other notes on the vertical integration. So the lower point potency hemp edibles, um, only two types of licenses for that, right? Retail, manufacture, one person, one entity can hold both of those. So, you know, there's some vertical integration that's allowed there too. Um, lower potency hemp edible, those licenses also allow you to hold licenses for other products. So, you know, food, tobacco, alcohol, I'm sure anybody that's in Minnesota, you know, that has has been out to a restaurant, to a grocery store, to or a liquor store, um, has seen, you know, THC seltzers, things like that um, available for sale now. So obviously, you know, you can you can be selling those, not the same for cannabis, right? You're not, you're not gonna, you know, be walking into uh, a bar and they're, you know, selling, you know, cannabis products. Um, the 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 important thing to note about lower potency hemp edibles, though, is that if you have a license for those, you cannot also hold a cannabis business license. So if you're selling, if you have the lower potency hemp edibles license, that's it. That that's all you're selling in, within the cannabis space. Um, to the contrary, if you have a cannabis business license, you can actually sell lower potency. Uh, hemp edibles. So you don't need that separate license. You can, you can sell both. You can sell your cannabis products. You can sell um, the hemp products. 
Um, so that's something to keep in mind if you're thinking about, you know, how do I enter this space? What type of license do I want? And you might be thinking, okay, well, you know, why, if, if the cannabis license allows me to sell both, why would I only want, um, you know, the hemp license? And, and there are a number of reasons for that. And, you know, one of them we have right here, just the idea that you can sell other things, you know, food, alcohol, things like that. Um, where you also sell the lower potency hemp edibles. But another reason is just, you know, going back to Steve talked about this, of course, you know, federal state law, the, um, you know, having a license for the lower potency hemp edibles is going to allow you access to, to more assistance, essentially, you know, it, it might give you access to better financing options, better insurance options, um, things like that. Cannabis is still federally illegal, as we know. And, um, you know, you may run into roadblocks with that depending on depending on your business needs. So just something to keep in mind. Um, if you're thinking about what type of license can I get? What type do I want? Um, you know, there's certainly advantages to both. And we certainly don't expect the lower potency hemp edible licenses to just go away once the cannabis uh, license uh, applications open up and start issuing. Because like I said, there are still a lot of advantages to having that license. Um, so so other, other areas where there's multiple license. So again, a little bit of an exception to vertical integration. Maddie, if you could go on to the next page. Um, so this is just a chart to show you. So again, general prohibition on vertical integration, but there are some, uh, some businesses that allow you, some types of licenses that allow you to have other licenses. Um, as you can see, not a lot of X's here. Um, so again, that prohibition on vertical integration. Um, but for example, you know, a, an event organizer license, um, you know, that a license holder of event uh, license can can have a cultivator license, can have a manufacturer license, can have a retailer license, things like that. Um, and so, you know, that there's some some things allowed here. There's some things you can do together. If you're a retailer, you can have a delivery license, things like that. Basically, the only thing that that you can see here that is that is really just if you're getting this license, that's all you get is the testing facility, which of course makes perfect sense. Um, they're not going to have you know a, a cultivator testing its own products, being a testing facility. Um, so that's just kind of a try a visual to see, you know, here's the, here's the few places where they do, they are going to allow vertical integration. Um, you can go on to the next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about what it takes to get the license. Um, there, the application is not out yet. As I mentioned, the OCM is still putting it together. They are doing rulemaking. Um, they are, are working on, on identifying how that application process will work within the confines of what the statute has required. So some things we know that, um, that are going to be required, and I'll just, I'll just tell you, um, I think the application is going to be lengthy. There is, this is a summary of what, what's going to be included, um, but it, it is quite a bit. So the contents um, general information, you know, address, things like that. And we actually will talk a little bit more about um, the address requirement because it is being construed as requiring any entity seeking a license to actually have, you know, the premises secured, um, building codes uh, or approval of, of building codes and things like that for the city. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so disclosure of ownership and control is kind of one thing that I wanted to touch on because there is a lot of information that's going to be required here. Um, you know, all, all the owners, any owner in a partnership, the partnership agreements, um, any bank accounts owned by the entity, um, loan obligations, financing, things like that, that's all going to be required to be a part of the application. Um, and that's just kind of one piece of it. You then have to have a security plan, you know, how are you going to secure your store, prevent theft, uh, things like that. And then a business plan, business plan, just most notably, you know, will have to include some environmental aspect to it. 
Um, so these requirements are, are within the statute. And again, OCM is, is making more specific rules on how they'll be kind of interpreted, interpreted and put into the application. Uh, granting a license, uh, the, it's a score-based process for now, um, and there's just there's a variety of different things that the score is based on. We're going to touch more, uh, touch on social equity more momentarily, but you know, again, fairly extensive security, business plan, environmental plan, um, and kind of related to the social equity piece, uh, there will be additional points added if they if you're going to expand service to an underrepresented market. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk about that and the social equity piece um, here in a minute. If you could go to the next slide, please, Maddie. Um, before I start, I will get into the CLE, or I'll announce the CLE code. So this is the second CLE code, 46817. Again, that number is 46817. Uh, Social equity. So in the statute uh, legalizing cannabis, there is an explicit priority um, that the OCM prioritize growth and recovery in communities that experience negative impact from cannabis prohibition. So the social equity piece is a big piece. You can see the qualifications um, there. One thing I think that's important to note is that uh, to get the social e equity benefit, it's all owners. So if you have, you know, a five person partnership for now, all owners have to have some uh, some impact uh, from, you know, a social equity perspective. It does, um, so that, that could include, you know, a, a conviction for sale or possession of cannabis and things like that. Um, notably, it can also include, you know, a family member of yours. So if you were impacted by uh, you know, a parent or a sibling or a child um, being convicted of possession or sale of cannabis, that that, that can also count for it. Um, the social equity piece will account for 20% of that total score that we mentioned before. So it's not an insignificant piece. Um, and it's it's certainly something to, to be aware of. Um, if you can go on to the next slide, maybe, please. The, uh, the last thing I kind of want to touch on the licenses that I think are, that's important to know is that um, the local governments have, have involvement here through the statute. So you can kind of see, here's what they can't do, here's what they can, here's what they must. So they cannot prohibit cannabis businesses. Um, they, they can't just say no, um, but they are um, bumping down to the must. They are, uh, they are required to to register um, or require the licensee to register with the town or city. Um, and so, you know, they can't prohibit it, but they do require registration. And, and as of now, at least they have, a, you know, a not insignificant amount of, of oversight. So they can restrict and regulate the uh, the Canada's businesses until January 1st, 2025. They can enact reasonable time, place and manner restrictions. Um, they can prohibit lo locations within a certain uh, amount of distance from certain locations. They can limit one license per 12,500 people. So just, just so you're all aware, that's, that equates to about 381 dispensaries throughout the state. Um, and then this, this piece I think is interesting. So they can provide additional information relevant to the license within 30 days of receiving the application for OCM. So applications complete. The OCM sends it to the city where the, where the operation is supposed to be located, and then the city can go back to the OCM within 30 days and provide them basically any information, um, you know, concerns about the location, concerns about the applicant, anything like that. So, you know, uh, to me, that just feels like a breeding ground for, for litigation, and, um, you know, we'll see how that all plays out. Um, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit on on the next slide, but there's there's some question about whether that that requirement will remain in place. So, like I said, the 2024 legislative session started yesterday, um, and I'm going to walk through these pretty quickly as we're running out of time. But on January 16th, the OCM gave its first annual report to the legislature. Um, asking them to essentially walk back from some of these. So one thing is that they are delayed. They are not on track to get licenses issued 
um, by early 2025, which is the goal. So they have asked for a, some sort of temporary licensing system so they can kind of get going on this. Let's, you know, let's get these businesses up and running. The law has been effective since August 1st. Let's get going. Um, they've also asked to eliminate certain requirements, one of them being that local government input. Um, again, breeding ground for litigation, complicated, seem, you know, a, a lot of issues with that. Um, there is also a requirement that, that, that any license holder secure a location before applying, and they've asked to eliminate that. Again, think of the capital requirements to get that location locked down without, you know, without even knowing if you're going to get a license. Um, and a couple other things I'll just touch on the social equity component. They've asked to change the mandate to 51% ownership. Again, you know, this is an attempt to kind of, um, get rid of some of those barriers to, to licensures, get these applicants, um, the capital they need to get these up and running. Um, and the hope is that they can get license issuing as soon as the summer. And I think I'll go to the last slide here and just quickly touch on this taxation. Um, basically you need to know 10% sale or 10% sales tax on gross retail sales. Um, that includes cannabis. That also includes those lower potency hemp edibles, um, which were not subject to any additional taxation um, since, they've, since they've been sold in July, 2020. Um, split 80-20 uh, between state and local. And then there's a couple of exemptions there that you can see, but I will, um, oh, and just of course not to forget, you know, it, cannabis not federally legal, but you're not off the hook for taxes on it. So, um, and then of course all applicable state and local taxes will apply. Um, so with that, we are we are one minute over, which I hope isn't too bad. And I really appreciate everyone's time and attention today. And uh, we are available for questions. Um, you know, the time is up, but via email. So I'll I'll pass it back to Doug. Thanks, Aaron, and thanks, Steve, for all that information. Just a couple of quick closing remarks. Uh, keep your eye out for our follow-up email, which is going to include the links to the program materials from today and the recording and the CLE survey. If you do have any questions from today's presentation, feel free to reach out to any of either of our present presenters with any questions you have. That concludes our webinar and thank you all for attending. Thanks all. Thank you.